probably going to get started. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me this afternoon for this talk. Uh, I know it's after lunch, so it's kind of hard to pay attention, but I'll, I'll make sure I have some interesting demos along the way and to keep your attention going. Well, this, this is a really long title, and I think I might have won the award for the longest title at PDC this year. <laughs> so anyways, the talk is about IS Media Services as a platform and how we use that platform to do Sunday Night Football. Uh, I want to do a quick poll, like how many of you have seen the Sunday Night Football experience already? Not too many. OK, that's nice, because then the demo means something. So OK, so Sunday Night Football is one of the greatest experiences so far of streaming online. So we will go into that and in a little bit. But so this, this next slide here shows how IS Smooth Streaming or IS Media Services as a platform has been used so far. So we, re we released a V1 of live smooth streaming, which was released as a part of IS Media Services 3.0 in fall. And it has, this platform has already been used in a lot of live events, including the Michael Jackson Memorial event, and a lot of events in Europe like Rai TV, and Tour de France, Tour de Italia, Giro de Italia, and then a lot of events locally here in US as well. So this, this platform has, has been proven to run at scale already. And then we'll see how we exactly we do these events in a, in a short while. Okay. So, so what I wanted to do today is like go over IS Media Services as a platform. So basically explain what are the various components of the platform and how they interact with each other. And then finally show how these components were used in SNF to deliver the end-to-end -end experience. I'll go over the end-to-end -end workflow of how, how exactly we set up the network, how the video flowed, how the ads flowed, and everything. And then we'll have some time in the end for questions. Unfortunately, it's just a one hour talk and a lot to cover. So I might go fast. So uh, keep noting your questions, and we can get to them in the end. Okay. So when we went out to do IS Media Services, we really had three goals in mind. The first goal was, how can we give an excellent user experience? So user experience is a pretty subjective thing, right? I mean, it's, it's hard to get it right. So, but we wanted to do a, the best possible job here with that, and I'll explain what that means in a little bit. Okay. Secondly, what we wanted to do is provide a platform for monetization of online video. So, you, if you can't make money on the video, it's not viable to do video online. So that's a very key component of your delivery pipeline or your delivery infrastructure. So we'll talk about how we enable you to do that. And finally, like how can we do this at scale without requiring a whole new parallel network? which is where cacheable HTTP comes in. So smooth streaming as a technology and IS Media Services as a platform for that technology is totally open HTTP. So there is no proprietary stuff that we have in here. So any client who can do a get essentially can get to the stream. And it should know how to play it, of course. But so, and we'll get into that a little bit in a little bit as well. Okay. So once again, the true experience or good user experience for us means you should be able to scale to true HD whenever possible. So if you have a good network and a good machine, you should get to HD. <coughs> However, if you don't have a great network or a great machine which is not capable of playing HD, we should scale you to wherever best you can go. And we'll cover that in a bit. Okay. And when we want the experience to be interactive, I don't want you to click on position in the timeline and wait for buffering cycle to go away. So I want that seek to work instantaneously so that you can actually seek to wherever you want in a quick fraction of a second. Platform to monetize media delivery. So whenever we talk about monetization, we typically talk about ads or advertising, right? But advertising is only a part of monetization. What's very interesting is along with ads, you need to support your ad delivery with analytics. So you need to show your customers value and why do they want to advertise with you. So this smooth streaming takes that step forward from ads and essentially has both ads and analytics on top of ads to provide you with a measure of how successful you are with monetizing your media. Okay. Finally, uh, scale. So the idea of smooth streaming was like, when we set up a single server on the web, you should be able to stream. You don't need a whole new network set up. So any server, any edge, any cache on the internet should be able to participate in your streaming delivery. However, as you scale, you may want to build up a network, but you don't have to, to begin with. So you just, you just put a single server up there, and, you, and the streaming should work for you. So I have mentioned IS Media Services, and I have mentioned smooth streaming. So how do these two relate? So IS Media Services is basically a whole platform, 
and smooth streaming is just a one part of that platform. So it, it's smooth streaming is our brand name for our adaptive streaming solution. <laughs> so we have both live smooth streaming and on-demand smooth streaming. In addition to that, in the platform, what we have is something called advanced logging. So this is also a critical piece of our monetization or analytics infrastructure. So what advanced logging gives you is an ability to collect logs both from the client on what kind of experience they are having and what kind of clicks they did, where, how did they interact with the video. In addition to, you can also get data from the server on delivery parameters and QoS and all that. So that's advanced logging. Then we have application request routing. Uh, this name is a little confusing, but we call it ARR for short. So this is our solution for a cache proxy, essentially. So if you, if you want to run an IS on the edge, this buys you some unique advantages because it's, it's smooth streaming aware. I mean, as I said earlier, smooth streaming is open HTTP, so any edge can really participate. However, some new functionality lights up if you're using ARR on the edge, okay? Smooth streaming player development kit. So this is something we did a beta in fall or in October, essentially. And what this helps you do is, it, we, will, we will go into this in a lot more detail, but at a very high level, it helps you build a smooth streaming client. So, and, and we'll see why, why that is important, because smooth streaming has a, a big portion of code running on the client, and we, and we will talk about it. And the last two features here are, are, are reminiscent of the old versions of IS Media Services. They still exist, and these features are essentially for if you don't want to do smooth streaming or you don't want to do a streaming on the web and just want to do progressive download, how can we make that better? So bitrate throttling helps you save bandwidth with progressive download, essentially. So we send you only bits you consume, not everything, unlike conventional progressive download. And web playlist is your server-side playlist solution for progressive download. Okay. So the, the focus of this talk is going to be on the top four bullets and not on the second two. But if you have questions, I'll be around. I'm, I'm happy to answer those for you. Okay. So one thing that I, one thing that I, if I want everybody to carry away from this room is smooth streaming is a server and a client platform. It's not just a server technology. I know all of us who come from conventional streaming backgrounds or who have done streaming in the past pretty much think of streaming as a server-side solution. However, that's not true in case of smooth streaming. A significant piece of code runs on the client. Okay? And uh, let's see what I mean here, and I'll go into a lot more details here. But before, I, before we see what I mean, let me show you what I mean. Okay? I have Scott Stanfield. Uh, he is uh, he's CEO of Vertigo. Scott has partnered with us, uh, Scott's team has partnered with us to do some unique and amazing experiences, and he'll do a quick demo of what we have so far. Cool, thanks, Vishal. And if I'll take this microphone, there we go. Great. Good afternoon. Um, how many of you watch the... I don't know if this microphone is... I'm going to zip up my little vest. There we go. By the way, this is my official Olympics wear from Ralph Lauren, representing Team USA. I'm going to give you a demo of the Olympics in just a second. First thing I want to show you is what Vishal's been talking about. Um, so only one football fan here? I think I saw one hand over there. Um, were you not watching Sunday Night Football? You with like the other 10 people? No. It's, uh, Sunday Night Football is actually the highest rated um, uh, broadcast for Sunday evenings. There's not a lot of competition, but there's also been some amazing football games. Patriots, Colts, anybody see that game this past Sunday? That was a nice one. You, if you have the ability, with any, um, while the broadcast is shown live on television, you can also experience, uh, if you don't have access to your television, you don't have cable, and you live in the United States, this does not work outside of our borders, um, you can experience Sunday Night Football online. And while this is coming up, there's going to be a pre-roll of an advertisement here. I'm you guessing for Yahoo. To enter I have seen this ad three or four hundred times. Time in fact, there's a, there's a where point where it flashes very share. quickly, and then this that little bouncing guy hops destroy. around. And there he is. Yes. A place that will launch a so I have to let this play. Nervous. In fact, the application is locked out, like you. with the exception of you. Made by you. It's the mute button. Thank heavens. <laughs> So we're able to get that in there, but this is how NBC is monetizing um, their, ex their exposure on the web here. So let's let this get started. This is, a, uh, this is actually an internal feed of a broadcast that we have. If you're a Giants fan, you might want to turn away. Long runs that he had. But this guy is frightening. When we talk to other defenders out there, the first guy they always bring up is Let this particular play pan out. Second and four. Watch play the throw down, down the field to intercepted. From Manning as the defense bites, wow. and then the pass is Okay, so let me show you a couple things here. 
Now, if you have TiVo, you can do the same thing. You can pause like this, and you can back up, which you, you may experience with you know, live television. But the ability to do all this in an HD environment, the square I'm showing you right now is not HD. I'll show you the, the full HD in a second. But I'm going to back this play up using the same timeline marker. Exactly like he has and switch in the past. And I'm now seeing the same uh, play unfold in the end zone camera. You notice it's sponsored by Office and Microsoft at the top. So there's an ad here the the camera there. angles. The first guy, Watch the offensive line, defensive line just kind of stand there as the play four. unfolds downfield. Play Something you don't normally see on TV. Touchdown. And find a shot of the Giants coach, Tom Coughlin, pouting about the interception. Dominic Hickson was there. And now. Dominic Rogers. So you, you, get, a, you get an experience. That's why it's called Sunday Night Football Extra. You get to see things that you would not normally see um, in the main broadcast feed. This is a. Um, this is all built on technology that we're going to talk about today. All the different things going on. Obviously, we have a video feed, we have an audio feed, we have a data feed, which is telling us when to roll commercials. When there's a broadcast break, we have to show you commercials that have been sold for an internet audience. You can see there's different sponsorship opportunities. When I was clicking around the different camera angles, um, there are times that they might roll an ad or have a cable that uh, a camera that's sponsored, in this case, by Gillette. So. Let me mute this as well. During the game, Andrea, um, the sideline reporter, I forgot her last name, Andrea Kramer will be Twittering and it'll show up at the bottom. We also have Pro Football Talk. We have one of the gurus from PFT answering questions in a live chat as the game goes on, Mike Florio. Um, we have real-time stats and we have video clips and highlights. So it's been a very good experience for NBC. They're very happy with this. We're very happy. We couldn't have done this in Flash. This is Silverlight. In fact, this is the first time we believe it's the first time we've had synchronized integrated cameras for a live internet broadcast. It's very difficult to do because we have four, uh, what, five different real-time views instantiated at the same time. We have some heuristics in the background to kind of slowly ramp those different camera angles up, but it really improves the experience. In fact, right now, we're only seeing this broadcast at 950 kilobits per second. If I go full screen, let me jump, let me jump ahead in the broadcast. Um, you'll see the bit rate start to ramp up as it's kind of testing the waters here. What you want to see eventually are those three or four bars convert to HD. And however, you're not going to see it in this room because these screens are pegged at 1024 by 768. The minimum HD resolution is 1280 by 720. So the heuristics involved you know, from, from this guy and what his team built, he's not going to give us that high-end bandwidth because it's a waste. NBC would be paying for bandwidth they're not using. So not only does progressive waste bandwidth, if I hit pause, I'm still going to get frames. Smooth streaming is very efficient on the bandwidth utilization. We're even efficient if I can't even show you all, all the HD resolution. I'm only going to give you a feed in which you're, you're capped at. So it's, it's a very clever way of maximizing. Now, granted, if I wasn't connected to the projector, you could come up and see it. It's, it's really sharp. Um, so that's the, you know, those are some of the, the key features in Sunday Night Football. So, I have two more quick things to show you. Um, it's not often you get the chance to work on something as spectacular as the Olympics, and it's something that we're really grateful for. What's interesting is that Sunday Night Football, in a sense, was a test case for the infrastructure and the video playback through all the partners involved for the Olympics. Let me show you how that's shaping up. So on November 4th, just last week on Tuesday, we launched, um, well, we are collectively, we launched the Olympics. I'm going to give you a sense of, of what this experience is going to be like and what you can look forward to on February 12th, which is 87 days, 4 hours, and 14 minutes away. As soon as you can call yourself an Olympic athlete, it's for life. It was just unreal. It was just being part of something way bigger than yourself. Any athlete from any country in any sport, you all have this common bond. The struggle, the victory. That spirit is real. It's authentic. It's that one pure thing that nothing can affect. Not war, not crime, not depression. To be surrounded by the greatest athletes, it was just phenomenal. In a time like this, when our country needs these Olympic Games, it's a great time to be an Olympic athlete. In 100 days, the Vancouver Olympics on NBC.
I realize the PDC represents audiences from all over the world, so I apologize. This is clearly geared towards the US audience because it's only available here in the US um, the, for NBC and the, the license rights they have here. Um, although the Olympics don't start for another three months, by the time it comes around, NBC plans on having over 1,500 hours of, of highlights and other sporting events. So they're gearing up and getting everybody ready as part of the countdown to Vancouver. I can't as I stay on the, the site, feeling that it will I keep going. It will roll top. into another video clip. And some of the experience that we have from Sunday Night Football, we've transformed back to here. Now, the video markers, the highlight clips are, are not in yet. Um, that will be coming online later. There are some features that we have in here that are, are really stunning. So a couple of, of extra DV, DVR features that we have um, as this pre-roll finishes. This is really something special. Sean White, snowboarding. It's from Carlsbad, California, not too far from here. This is a, uh, a highlight clip Definitely about Lindsey Vaughn. If you're an Olympics fan, you, you'll, you'll see, um, she's probably our, our biggest gold medal hopeful for the women's downhill. And she competed in the 2006 Torino Olympics. In fact, this is a highlight clip from that. So I'm clicking around. Let me find that spot, it's about right here. If, um, if you are squeamish, you might want to turn away. I'm gonna put this in slow motion. Now, it, it has a happy ending, otherwise I wouldn't have shown it. Um, I'm going to fast forward. So she was airlifted off the, the field and taken to the hospital, and they thought she had a broken pelvis. Just three or four days later, she was back competing in the same event. She didn't medal, but she did finish the event, which is great. So she, able, she was able to kind of pull through it and, and go. Um, we do expect try my best and more of these highlight clips. This is the way that the NBC time, Sports a tells the story of the Olympics. It's through the Olympians' eyes themselves. So they will continue to create lots of highlight clips from the perspective of, of mostly probably some of the U.S. athletes. But they're gearing up for this. Um, last thing, if you, um, if you aren't able to make it to Scott Guthrie's keynote in the morning, which I highly recommend you do, you can view the same technology that's powering the Olympics and powering Sunday Night Football at MicrosoftPDC.com. Um, this morning, we had over 8,020 concurrent peak and viewers of, of uh, the keynotes you know, from like the PDC the Hall. And, like and right now, what we're seeing is Channel 9 Live they down on the show floor. They were so, so we were able to and use so the same technology, and Vishal's going to go into more no detail about some of the underlying code and, and, and when you will be able to get your hands on it. But the it's the same stuff. The now, the infrastructure behind the scenes, it's not something that I personally can easily pull off. There's a satellite truck beaming from here, well, at least for the keynote, down to iStream Planet, they've got a rack, uh, they're there in Las Vegas, they've got racks of uh, inlet spinnaker boxes um, that are compressing the video for smooth streaming, it gets pushed up to the content distribution network, and eventually our player will pull that down, synchronize with the Twitter feed and the other XML data that's going on. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes, but for those of you that are .NET programmers uh, and designers, you can get your hands on this stuff really soon and start, start experimenting. And there is a way for you, as part of developer experience, to do everything on one box. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Vishal. If you have any questions, I'll be in the back of the room at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Thank you. I, I'm, really glad every, I'm really glad everybody liked it. Uh, so let's see how it was done. And because I think that's what we're here for. So, so this is a quick kind of what you saw in the demo just now. So you saw HD quality video. You saw live ad insertions, which was a Yahoo and the Gillette ads. All of them were done using the client and the server technologies. And I'll talk about them in a bit. You saw alternate camera angles. You saw instant, instant replay, slow motion, fast forward, and rewind controls. You saw a timeline, so you can control anywhere in the live stream or in the on-demand stream, wherever you want to go and start watching. You saw key play markers, so important events that occur during the game. You can just click on that marker and go directly there and watch what happened. Okay. So, and you saw a quality meter, so it kind of tells your users what kind of quality they are getting, and I'll explain how this works in a little while. Okay. So. So before we understand how this was done, let's understand what smooth streaming really is. Uh, because I think I, I saw a lot of hands on people who have not tried this, so it might be good to go over the slide. So let's, before we understand smooth streaming, let's understand how technologies that existed before smooth streaming worked. So in all cases, there's always a video sitting on the server, right? So in the first technology, which is progressive download, what happens is you start downloading that video, and you keep playing as 
as alongside, right? I mean, as it is downloaded, you're also watching it. So that's what becomes progressive download, okay? The problem here is like there is no fine-grained control. I mean, you cannot control how much you get. Basically, the server, the client keeps downloading. So if your pipe is really fat and you only want to watch 20 seconds of content, you might have downloaded all of it by then. So you are wasting bandwidth, okay? So, but, but this is totally stateless. Like any server can do progressive download. You don't have to have an end-to-end -end network set up to do that, okay? Contrary to that, streaming is a more controlled technology. So there are dedicated protocols like RTSP, RTMP, or even HTTP streaming from Windows Media Services earlier. These work as a protocol. So what happens is the client comes up and then tells the server, can you please describe what you have? And the server will respond with a fixed message saying, these are all things I have. I have audio in English, I have audio in Japanese, and so on. And then the client will say, okay, set me up for that audio and this video. So this, the connection is set up, and then the client issues commands like play, pause. So all these essentially go through a fixed protocol channel, and the server each time responds with packets. Okay? So the, the challenge, the advantages, first of all, the advantages here are like it is a very controlled environment, so you, you only get what you want or what you, what you can play, so you don't get extra. But the challenge here is there is a handshake happening between the client and the server, which means there is a persistent connection between the client and the server. So it is not really stateless. And the biggest challenge with this is the first mile challenge. What I call the first mile challenge is, in this case, you are constrained by how many clients your origin server can support. Okay? So because every client is maintaining a persistent connection, you need to have that connection going all the time. Okay? So, so contrary to that, smooth streaming is kind of a best of both worlds. So what we do is we still have a file on the server. And the client, instead of requesting the entire video, requests that video in two second chunks. Two second is our default value, but it, it's not really needed to be two seconds. You can have five or 10 or whatever. But so what, what happens is the client says, I want this video at one minute, four seconds into the video. The server picks up this, that portion of the video for two seconds, sends it over to the client. And while it is going, any HTTP cache sitting on the way can actually cache content. So they, it can participate and scale. Right? Similarly, like once I've watched that on the client, I want to get the next two seconds, and this process keeps on repeating till I'm watching the stream, right? So now what happens if the second client comes up? In this case, you don't have to go back to the origin. So your cache has a copy of it, and it serves right off there. So, so what's really happening is you have kind of solved the first mile challenge. So you're not really constrained by your origin servers. And there are various kinds of edges out there already like ISP, if Comcast, if you use, if you're in US, Comcast might have that, their own edges, your enterprises, your work offices may have their own edges. So each of these contributes and helps you scale your experience. And this is what I said when I meant, like if you put a single server, you can still do streaming. Of course, if you set up a network, you can do better and more scalable streaming, but nothing preventing you from doing it with a single server, okay? So now, now that we understand smooth streaming, let's understand a typical topology on how these networks work, right? Most of the time, you have a source, right? The source could be a video feed or a satellite feed or whatever, which is encoded and sent to an, uh, to an origin server, right? A media origin server. Then you, because there's a first mile challenge, you might, most cases, have distribution servers. So what these help you do is they kind of act as origins, but they help you fan out. So they help you support more clients. And there are other uses of distribution servers which are like regional servers. For example, if you have a feed in US, you might want to set up a regional server in France to deliver to France, okay? Then finally, you have the edges, which could be your CDN, which could be your ISP, which could be your enterprise. And then last, last in the food chain is basically the client who actually consumes the video and plays it back, okay? So, so one very interesting challenge here, I talked about the first mile challenge, but there's another unique challenge here, the last mile challenge. So what happens is, Sometimes you have, a very great, you have a great computer, but you have a very small pipe. Basically, you don't have enough bandwidth to play HD content. So in that case, your concern is primarily like, what is the best quality I can download, right? Okay? Contrary to that, if you have a low-end PC or an old, old, old kind of laptop sitting around, but you have a very good, fast, high-speed connection, your concern is how, 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 what is the best quality I can play or render. But if you have best of both worlds, then you don't care about all of these. You just care about the best quality period, right? So these conditions change every second. So I might have a good network now, but I might start downloading something else, and the, or the network itself changes. So an ideal solution 
which solves the last mile challenge should be able to adapt to these changes. Okay? So, and smooth streaming is, is essentially what it can do that, and let's see how it does that. Okay? So when I told you there's a file on the server, I actually didn't tell you the complete picture. There are actually more than one files on the server for video asset. So, it, so these are the same video, but encoded at different resolutions or different bit rates. So you have a low quality video, which is 300K, and then you have a high quality video, 2.4 megs, and then everything in between. So what happens is when the client actually comes back with the request for video at, at one, one minute and four seconds, there is actually a piece on running in the client, piece of code, which is the heuristics code, which is actually trying to make decisions on what quality is the best for you, keeping the challenges from the previous slide in mind. Okay? So in this case, I'm giving an example of network, but you can imagine a similar thing happens for your CPU load as well. Okay? So we always start with the lowest bit rate, and this is done so that your startup can be instantaneous. Okay? Then, but as we download the first piece of video, which is taken from the 300K file in this case and sent out to the client, we measure what kind of bandwidth you got. Okay? And the next piece of video we download is at two seconds into the video, but by now we already know you have a better network than 300K. So the next piece of chunk we download will be at 700K in this case. Okay? Similarly, we keep repeating this process and keep changing according to your network changes, and ultimately we play all these small pieces from different files on the server or different quality streams seamlessly, as a, so you can't notice the switches between those streams. So this is essentially smooth streaming, and a similar kind of logic applies for how you're able to render. So we measure how your rendered frames per second and dropped frames per second are acting up. So if you're an old laptop, you'll drop frames. That will tell us we need to go down in quality. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so we talked about this. So, and I, I want to park this thought here because I will get back to client, but before I get back to client, I wanted to cover the other pieces in the topology, so, or the platform rather. So one of the pieces I talked about was advanced logging. So one thing that we have with, with smooth streaming, as you see, is like we are making a lot of intelligent choices on the client, which means we have way more data than anybody else ever had on the client in terms of what kind of quality you're getting, what kind of network you're getting, how we are adapting to it. So we, so when you download these videos, we actually keep tracking this data. And with our advanced logging module for IS, you can set up an advanced logging server and send all of this data back to server through, through standard HTTP post messages. So advanced logging will, will knows how to interpret these messages and, and create log files out of them. In addition, it also allows you to get all of this data in real time. What I mean is you don't have to wait for it to be logged to a file. You can write a small module which extends advanced logging and get all of this data in real time and process it. So imagine having a dashboard app which tells, tells your boss or whoever's the higher up, high up in your organization or, or your customers for that matter, how many clients do I have connected right now? What are they doing right now? Am I noticing any network glitches in, the, in my network? So it, it enables those kind of scenarios. It doesn't do it out of the box, but it lets you do that as a solution. If you're a solution provider, this is one way you can add value on top of the platform. So as I said, these are standard HTTP post messages. So any server can essentially interpret these messages, but at the same time, advanced logging has all the support built into parse these and make them available to you in a meaningful form. Okay. Another thing I talked about is distribution servers and edge servers. So now I'm going to talk about ARR. So what happens is, as I said, it's open HTTP, and I don't know how many times I'm going to say this in this talk, but, but that's what it is. So open HTTP means any ad edge or any distribution server can really work with the stream. However, as I said earlier, if you have ARR installed on one of these distribution servers, you get unique value adds. For example, your authentication workflow can happen at the distribution server because ARR is capable of using the same authentication settings as, as smooth streaming. Okay? Similarly, if you install ARR at the edge, you get all the caching benefits. But in addition, it is live smooth streaming aware. So what it means is, if if your chunk is not ready yet, or if that two seconds of video for the live is not ready yet, and multiple clients try to request it, ARR will block them from going to the origin. Therefore, it will help you cope up with the first mile challenge I talked about earlier. Okay. So the, I think the question, coming back to the client, right? So the question that might have been in your head since then is the client seems way too complicated, right? So I mean, how do I build a player, right? I think I'll, I'll build on this and I'll answer the question how to build a player 
towards the end of the slide, but I'll, I'll kind of go over why the client is not as complicated as it looks, or what are we doing to make sure we abstract that complication from you, okay? So for that, we released the IS Smooth Streaming Player Development Kit. So what this does is, so, let's, I mean, so what this kit is, is like it is a combination of tools and, and, and software development kits for you. So the primary piece, component of this player development kit is the Smooth Streaming Player SDK. So what you get with this is an element called a Smooth Streaming Media Element. Like, are people familiar with the Silverlight Media Development? I mean, yeah, okay, not very many. So Silverlight exposes a media element for you. So anybody who's building a Silverlight app for media can just use that media element class and it has methods like play, pause, stop. So we have, we have taken that a step forward, further and we are giving you a similar interface. I mean, a very, I mean, it's almost identical looking. It has some added functionality for smooth streaming. So all you need to do is, and I'll show you in a demo in a short while, is just use this interface and just call play if you want to play the stream, pause if you want to pause, or if you want to just control the playback rate, there are APIs for that. And, and this is where I say there is an API for that. I think people from US might understand that joke a little bit. There is an app for that. <laughs> anyways, anyways. So another part of this development kit is the push encoder. So we, we realized like, on-demand smooth streaming, we already have a tool which Microsoft ships, which is expression encoder. So it is, it is available for 49 bucks if in case somebody wants to buy that tool. So that gives you capabilities to encode streams for smooth streaming on-demand content. It does not give you capabilities for live smooth streaming. So now the next thing is we have a lot of partners who do that, like Inlet, Rosette, D Digital Rapids. I, mean, I, I don't want to go into names, but there are a whole bunch of partners who do that today. But for somebody who just wants to try it out, we have this tool called Push Encoder. So you can point this tool to an on-demand asset and it'll generate a pseudo live stream for you, for you to be able to test out this functionality or just see how live smooth streaming works. Okay? And it, it, this tool is also capable of doing live ad insertions and we will get on how we do that in a little bit, but just keep that in your mind. So this tool is a two one-stop shop for testing smooth streaming live and ad, ad insertions and metadata insertions and everything. And finally, we ship a smooth streaming player. So if you haven't been to, you should go to is.net slash media, and you'll see a small bird up there in the right-hand corner, top right-hand corner. If you click that, that'll take you to a player. And that player will show you how smooth streaming is reacting to your network changes through visualizations. So we, sh we ship that player as a part of this PDK. So you can use that player in your own environment to test or play around with smooth streaming if you want. Or you could simply go to the site and try it out. So, so what, is, what is Smooth Streaming Client PDK all about? As I said, it's an, it's an API for developing Smooth Streaming Player applications. So it abstracts all the nitty gritties of the platform or what the platform is doing under the cover, how the heuristics work, and still allows you to configure them, but you don't really have to worry about them if you don't need to. Okay. It has a rich set of, is rich feature set. So as, we, as Scott showed you in the demo, like we, have a, we actually have APIs in the platform that help you schedule ads. So all you need to do is like call that API and say this is an ad, and we take care of the rest for you. We, we automatically stop the mainstream, pause it if you want, or if we let it continue if you don't want, in case of live, and then we play the ad, disable all the controls, and then go back to the media. And while we are doing this, there are APIs that let you know about the ad progress. Like we will tell you according to IAB standard, which is Internet Advertising Bureau, they mandate standards like the ad tracking has to be done based on quartiles, so we raise quartile tracking events, like first quartile, midpoint, third quartile, and complete, okay? Then we have analytics. So as I said, like we, have, we collect a lot of data. We collect around 150 fields on the client, I mean, just to give you an idea. And we send those back to the logging server. So, so we have analytics capabilities. And then we have trick play. We just saw a demo, we have slow motion. Uh, in our beta, we don't have fast forward rewind yet uh, implemented, but we will, we will have that very soon. Uh, so, so these ads and analytics together help you provide a monetization platform. And as I said earlier, it's, it's basically a superset of Silverlight Media Element. So you get everything you have in Silverlight Media Element with Smooth Streaming Media Element, plus you get additional APIs like analytics or advertisements and trick play, which are not there in Silverlight today. Okay. So, and for, for, for all of those who are starting to worry about like if any edge can cache my content, how do I protect my content? So for that, you use DRM. PlayReady is the solution there. And then we, we have PlayReady integration in this P3 
player development kit. So you don't have to do anything if your content is protected. We'll just play it fine. Okay. And then one more thing that you saw there was multiple camera angles. So just to kind of give you a background on that, they were all a part of a single stream. And there were APIs being used on the client to filter which camera angle you were watching. So there was no fancy magic of media elements flying around on the screen. It was just pure API calls to say, I want to watch camera one versus camera two versus camera three. Okay. So there were five instances of smooth streaming media element running in that player. And you were filtering on every instance on what you want to see in that instance. Okay. So this is a little more geeky slide, but essentially what this is kind of at a high level explains the architecture on how we think an ideal player will be built. So you, you have Silverlight at the bottom of the pipeline, which is our native rendering pipeline. We, we have built a layer called Smooth Streaming Media Element on top of it, which exposes all these interfaces for you to write code against. And we talked about most of these interfaces already. The analytics interface is in a slightly different color because we don't today expose in our beta one this analytics data via API, but we will do that very soon. Today our data is exposed to HTTP post messages, which go back to advanced logging server or any, any HTTP server for that matter. However, like as we see this evolving, there will be repetitive pieces of code that people will write. For example, if DoubleClick is your primary ad platform, you will need to write integration with DoubleClick, or DoubleClick will need to do that. So we call this concept a vertical extension. And, and so this is an ideal architecture, and I'll show you, I'll have a surprise announcement at the end of the session, which I, I want you to wait for, and on how this architecture we've used in something we're doing. But anyways, I don't want to give out too much. So, so so people over a period of time will write these repetitive pieces of code, which you should be ideally able to just take and plug into your player application without having to reinvent the wheel. So we call this, this, this layer a vertical extension layer. So as a part of SNF and Olympics, we already have a lot of partners who are writing these extensions. For example, DoubleClick has written one for ads. So if you put that DLL into your player, you get DoubleClick integration. And I'll talk on how that works in terms of workflow in a short while. Okay. So, we have Conviva. Conviva is another interesting partner. They do real-time analytics. So the stuff I talked about earlier, what, my, what is my player doing right now, they give you the ability to track that. They have also integrated with this platform. Okay. And finally, at the topmost layer, you have the final UI on how your player is presented. So, so if you look at it like you could have a single player for your organization, if you have multiple, if you have multiple players, you could have a single smooth streaming media element plus vertical extension layer and just skin it differently for all your different players. So it's a pretty modular architecture. Okay. So at this point, I'm gonna show you a very quick demo uh, because I don't want to overwhelm you the terms but and show you really how easy it is. So what we'll see in this demo is how can you build a smooth streaming client in five very easy steps. So when I say very easy, I mean they are really easy. So let's go into that. Unfortunately, my computer decided to go to sleep. Okay. So I have Visual Studio. So I, I said five easy steps, so let's count. The first step is to create a new project. Okay. I'll create a Silverlight application. I don't care about a name. Why not? So I have created a Silverlight project, which is what you do if you want to create a Silverlight application. I, I had already pre-downloaded the Smooth Streaming Player Development Kit. So I'm going to add the reference to SSME DLL, or SME as our partners fondly call it. So, okay. So the next thing I need to do here is, so two steps. The third step is I need to edit the XAML to include. I'll call this namespace SSME. Okay. And then in the grid, I'll just say SSME, call it smooth streaming media element. I'll give it a source. Smooth streaming source is equal to, and let me, let me, I have a URL pretty kind. Let me put that URL in there. And I'll set autoplay to false. So the moment you start running this application, we should autoplay to true, sorry. The moment we start running the application, we should start playing the video. So that, that was step three. And, and all you need to do is just hit F5. That's, that's all it takes. 
Yeah, let's enable debugging. Doesn't matter. Okay. So, I mean, this is a very, very basic player. You see, there's no play button, there's no pause button, nothing. So, just getting player media playing was as easy as that. So, let's kind of try to quickly modify it to include some basic controls in there. Okay. So what I've done is, I didn't want to waste your time, so I have already have code which I'll paste here. So what you see I'm doing here is, I'm including a slider for the volume bar. I'm including a button for the play and pause, okay? So if you look at this, this smooth streaming media element is totally XAML aware and you, you can use it in expression blend if you're designing players. And, and it also supports all the concepts like data binding. So in this case, all I'm saying is my volume control is directly bound to the volume property on SME. So you don't have to write any code behind that. At the same time, play button, I need some special code, so I'm gonna do that. Okay. Okay, so there's a code behind file. Okay. So I got these two methods here. I'll copy paste the code quickly. So all I'm doing here is looking at autoplay and setting and setting the text on the player. So in this case, what I'm doing is saying what happens when you click that button. So all I'm saying is like, if it is play, make it pause. If it is pause, make it play. Oh. So same player you saw earlier, but now you have volume controls. You can pause, play. I mean, so, so basically the idea of showing this demo was like you can do whatever you want with it, but the basic part of it is taken care for you. You don't have to do a whole lot to get the video working. Of course, you can get creative with the design after that. Okay. So, so a recap of what we have seen so far. So we saw smooth streaming and how it is used for true HD delivery. We talked a lot about cacheable HTTP, probably way more than you would have thought we would. So, and then we saw how you can use the client and the server platform together to build and easily build players using the SSME SDK. Okay. We, talked, we talked briefly about both advanced logging and application request routing and the unique advantages they bring to the platform outside of smooth streaming. Okay. So with that, I, I want to now go into the SNF part of it on how this platform was ultimately used for SNF. But before we do that, I don't know how many of you are aware, last year we did Olympics, Beijing Olympics, with the same technology, essentially. And or a similar technology, I must say, we have improved upon it since then. So we learned a few lessons along the way, right? One of the lessons we learned is like, we need to reduce the end-to-end -end workflow complexity. So, and we'll, I'll show you how we did that. Then, we, then in Beijing, what we were doing was there was no single big file on the server, there were a lot of small files on the server. So which added to complexity of managing these so many files on the server, okay? So we needed to solve that problem. And, and you have seen now we, we, we do solve that problem because we have a single file per bit rate on the server, okay? And how can we build solutions that can be reused by partners and customers rather than every time having to go to the drawing board and create solutions from the scratch? So, so these were the top three lessons we learned. And let's see how we try to incorporate that into our thinking now. So this, this figure here, kind of at a very high level, talks about how streaming flowed end to end in the SNF setup. So we had a live event, which was whichever, whichever stadium the football game was going on in. There was, a, there was a satellite broadcast tower out there, which was, you know, it's not a building actually, it's probably a production van somewhere. So that van would send all the video streams via satellite. And then the iStream Planet, who's our partner, who was a partner for this event, would take this input from the satellite, process it, run it through a bunch of inlet encoders, and basically send it out to Microsoft ECN. So Microsoft ECN, in this case, was hosting our origin servers. Okay? And then finally, this data was available to Akamai, who was our CDN partner, and finally to our clients. Okay? So at a very high level, this was the end-to-end -end arrangement and how different partners played a role. Okay? So before I explain this in a little more detail, I wanted to go 
over the core delivery backbone first, so that, because that's a repetitive piece we'll see in all subsequent slides, so I just wanted to spend a little bit of time here. So this is from the time we get the video to the time we send the video out to the pl player. Okay? So the first step here is an ingest server. So what an ingest server is is simply a, the, the point which in encoder interacts with on the network. So, so this is, you can think of it as like a server which takes bits from the encoder and hands it off to the origin, which is our next layer. So both of these layers were hosted inside Microsoft ECN. And the reason we broke it up into two layers is so that we can have redundancy and also prevent, so typically when you have redundancy, which means that you need to have two origins, primary and backup. And if you want to have both to have stream, you need to send two streams from the encoder. So instead of doing like that, because the pipe from the encoder to the origin is limited, so what we did is we had a single stream coming in and then the ingest would fan it out, just for redundancy, okay? Then finally we had Archimai CDN, who was the edge at the other side of it, and this data came from the encoder, it went to a single ingest, the single ingest fed both the origins as primary and backup, and then the primary origin fed the CDN, and finally this data went to the client. Okay. So if you see, notice here, there is, it was a pretty big event, and there was no distribution server needed. So this was just an ingest and origin combination we did for this event. Okay. So let's see the video workflow now on how the video flowed through this network. So as I said, like Ice Cream Planet was our partner. They took the feed from the satellite, decompressed it, ran it through a bunch of inlet encoders. Okay. And then we had the core delivery backbone. We talked about this in the last slide. Okay. And finally, we had the end user. So the data would come from the satellite, fed through inlet encoders, go to the network, and finally go to the client. It was, it was as simple as that, essentially. So all the video feeds, all the bit rates, everything live was, was flowing through this network in this pattern. Okay. So, so now let's see how we did live add insertions with this kind of a model. This is a little more involved workflow, so let's go over it step by step. So iStream Planet also built an ad application. So what the ad application's job was, like translate inputs from an operator. Think of the operator as a person with a red button. So they are watching the screen and they hit the red button moment they want an ad inserted. So how this data came to Ice Cream Planet to this application and they had to convert it into a, a smooth streaming stream essentially. So this looked I, exactly as the video and audio streams look like. So that <coughs> network was there. Okay. Then we had the core delivery backbone we talked about earlier. Then we had an ad content server because all ads we served for SNF were smooth streaming ads. So they, they had to be hosted on a server somewhere. So this is that server. We had DoubleClick, who was the database for all the ad metadata. Okay. And then finally, we had the end user. Okay. So the NBC ad operator always was always watching the stream coming in. Okay. So whenever he saw there's an ad to be inserted, he would go hit on his red button, which essentially means interact with the ad application and tell that there's an ad spot here. So this information would be sent by Ice Cream Planet to the pipeline, and then we would deliver this information all the way back to the client, okay? And then the client, which is smooth streaming media element, would raise an event back to the application, which in this case happens to be double click and Vertigo application, and they will then go and make a double click request to see what ad should be served now. So this was a dynamic decision. It was not statically linked ads. So you basically decide what ads are to be played based on your audience and all that kind of stuff. So the ad information was downloaded from DoubleClick, and moment the time reached on the timeline where this ad is supposed to be played, we download the ad from the server and send tracking information back to DoubleClick via their vertical extensions. Okay. So, 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 so yeah, kind of like so what 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 happens is like ad information flows from the operator to the application. The application sends it to a delivery pipeline. The pipeline sends it to the client. The client requests the ad information from DoubleClick server and finally downloads the ad, plays it, and as it is playing it, gives tracking information back to the double-click server. Okay. Metadata was done in a very similar manner, so which is the, all the diamonds you saw on the timeline on important like touchdowns or goals or whatever you want to call it, depending on the event. So, so what happens is like this, there was a satellite feed for the data coming to Ice Team Planet. They converted that satellite feed into fragmented MP4, which is the smooth streaming format, sent it to the delivery backline, and then the pipeline delivered it to the client, and then the Vertigo application built on top of SSME rendered that diamond spot on the timeline at the accurate position. Okay. So one thing you may notice here is like 
most workflows look very similar in nature. And that's the going back to our lessons from Beijing, which is like, how can we simplify end-to-end -end workflow? And how can we make reusable assets rather than just one-time assets? So, so once iStream Planet has written this tool, they don't have to write every time for a new event. This can just be reused as is. Okay. This is a slightly more involved architecture diagram. So this is, this is just a, a different take on what you saw in the previous slides. And it, so it explains the same architecture, which is like a feed coming in from satellite and then going to an encoder, then going to an encoder, going into the ingest server. And similarly, the add tools and the metadata, which is PBP, which is play by play. So NBC calls those markers on the timelines play by play markers or key play markers. So all of these fed into the IS ingestion. And finally, the delivery backbone took care of making sure this content reaches the client and finally gets rendered in the right way. So the way we do this, basically, we have two kinds of streams on the server. One is a continuous stream, which is audio and video, and one which is a sparse stream. For example, you don't always have ads flowing around in the network, or you don't always have metadata flowing around in the network. So these streams, by nature, are sparse streams. Okay? So there is a sparse track handler in IIS, and both these streams, from a stream perspective or over the wire format, look exactly identical. All of these are fragmented MP4 chunks. So, so basically, what what IS knows how to treat these separately, which is the IS Media Services Smooth Streaming Platform. And then it, it knows how to make sure this information reaches the client. The client knows what to do with this information. And using all its multiple interfaces and extensions, the right thing happens on the client. Okay. So, so what's next? So Silverlight Media Framework. So this is a big announcement, which this goes live tomorrow. So you remember one, I showed you an architectural diagram and I said I have an announcement later. So this is what that was. So we are announcing a Silverlight Media Framework. So this is basically using all the knowledge or the wealth of knowledge we built up over the events we did so far, which includes SNF, Olympics, and Microsoft PDC. We took the core components of the player that were used and created a platform out of it, which is Silverlight Media Player Platform. So this is open source platform. You can download it off CodePlex starting midnight. I have tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.? OK. So I have, I have Mike here, who's running this project. So if you have questions regarding this, you can go to Mike. But, but, but at a very, very high level, so what, what this does is like, it gives you all the controls. For example, how do you, the only thing you need to do if you don't want to do anything else is just skin the player appropriately for your needs. Okay? So, or if you want to get deep with it, you can go and write new extensions in the player. It has an extensibility framework and enhance the player for your experience. But as I said, it is totally open source, so you can download it. And this uses SSME underneath, so it takes care of interfacing with the smooth streaming media element and the player development kit. Okay. Another announcement I had to make is smooth streaming porting kit. So one of the efforts our team is, cogniz is working on and a, a need for the market really is, how do I reach those endpoints which don't have silver light, for example? Right? Or how do I reach those endpoints that cannot have silver light? That's the bigger question. Like, For example, very low-end set-top boxes. How do I do smooth streaming to those? So our team is working on a porting kit, which is a native porting kit, so which will be available for our partners to write smooth streaming endpoints, which do not have the capability to run Silverlight today. Okay. So, so call to action. Uh, I would request all of you to go to iis.net slash media. You will find download links off there. Try this technology out, and also try the SSPDK and let us know your feedback. Okay, and if you are interested in more details on the announcements, you can go to our website once again. And the third bullet is the biggest bullet, really. I mean, we have built this technology. As you saw, even when before this technology went beta, we already had a lot of live events we had done, because we strongly believe in actually taking feedback from customers while we are designing this solution, so that we really design something that works for them. So this is a very, very, very important point for us, and I can't stress it enough, that please let us know your feedback. Try this out. What would work better for you? Are there other enhancements you would like to see? And I, and I promise we'll listen. So, so the best way to give feedback is, of course, go to is.net forums. There is a media forum. Just post it there. If you don't feel comfortable, you can email your feedback to, uh, to myself. I'll, I can share my email address in the end. So, Whatever way is comfortable for you, but, but do make sure you send us your feedback. Okay? And 
as I said, this is IS Media Services 3.0 but it is only the V1 of live smooth streaming. This is the first time we did live smooth streaming. So there is a lot of other exciting things in the pipeline. I can't talk about all of them unless we are under NDA. So we have a TAP program which we run. So in case you are interested, we can see how we can get you on that. And so stay tuned. Uh, we'll, we'll probably have a lot more exciting stuff coming your way very soon. Okay. Uh, with that, I would like to break for questions. We have about seven minutes. Okay. Uh, okay, sure. Does um, the smooth streaming um, framework, running it on I have smooth streaming, does that support HTTPS? So the question is, does smooth streaming support HTTPS? So HTTP is handled at a layer below IS essentially, so we are an IS extension. So it is transparent to us. So, the, so I, I don't know how much you know about the IS pipeline but you can write extensions in the IS pipeline, and the actual HTTP protocol is handled by the layer below us, so we are pretty transparent to that. But ha having, having said that, I mean, we haven't done a lot of testing with HTTPS as a platform, so if you have that need, we can talk about it. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, I wonder what's the plan for uh, uh, enabling the streaming on the .NET Micro Framework? How you, how you guys, are you doing something with them? With .NET? With the .NET micro framework for embedded devices. Yes, so as, as I said earlier, like we, have, we totally have plans of reaching all kinds of devices. So we have started with Silverlight and .NET framework, but, and that's one of the reasons why we are doing porting kit as well. So as many endpoints as we can reach, definitely. So I mean, this is like an evolution. Uh, I mean, Windows Media Services still does a lot of things this does not do yet. But I mean, we really, the, one of the challenges we faced with Windows Media Services was how, how do we really scale it for the, the challenges we talked about, the first mile and the last mile, right? So we had to do a considerable rework. So it's, it's not a competition. It's really an evolution. Our team owns both of those technologies. So we still work on Windows Media Services, and that continues to be supported. But this is where we see the future going, essentially. Uh -huh. I have a question on this side. Sure, <clears throat> sorry. Um, does Windows Azure also contain the IIS extensions that you talked about? And can I build uh, the same applications using the Windows Azure platform? Uh, not yet. Okay, I mean, but, but it depends on what you mean by a Windows Azure application. If it's just an endpoint, then this DLL can be used. But if you're talking about actually delivering smooth streaming from an Azure yes. platform, uh, not yet, but but we are, talk, we are we are working on that. So, do you think in the future we can instead of using Akamai, can use the CDNs, which is available as a part of the Windows Azure platform, and uh, the Azure Compute, uh, basically delivering the smooth streaming applications? Uh, yeah. So, basically, the question is, can we use Azure instead of CDNs like Akamai or whatever? But yeah. but but as I said, I mean, it does not work with Azure yet. We're working on that, but once it works, you should be able to use it, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, we, we don't have a story yet, we're working on that, yeah. I mean, the Silverlight offline would work, but. Yeah, yeah. Out, Silverlight Auto Browser will work, but I think he was talking about more from a thick client perspective, a WPF or something. I'm looking more for like more low-level description. What is actually happening under the hood? Like what codecs do you use? What kind of you know what file do you have on the server? Do you actually have one file that's twice there? I'm just curious to get. I would maybe understand it better from that angle. There. Sure. So if you go to is dot not slash media. There will be a link. There was a blog post by Alex Zembelli, which kind of explains or goes into deep about this. So my, my email, I, I, I didn't put on the slide, but my email alias is vsood, vsood at microsoft.com. Uh, if you send me an email there, I'll be happy to send you a link on that. Okay. What was the question? So the question was like, how can I get information at a more lower level as to what are the codecs used, and what is the format, and all that? And, and that will help me understand better. 
you offer any live transcoding between bit rates to support the smooth streaming, or did they all have to exist prior to the stand-up of the on-demand stream? We don't do that today, yes. So we expect the encoder to be doing that, yes. Are there any plans to do that? Because if you have a large media collection, storing the multiple bit rates becomes prohibitive. Uh, we don't have any immediate plans of doing that, yes. So how do we encrypt the ISMV file with Play ID? So there are a lot of encoders that are coming up now that offer that support inbuilt. Like Expression Encoder also does that now. So you, they allow you to check box Play ID and then you can encrypt your files while encoding. So, so yes, so one of the things we are looking at we, in that direction, what we can do. But I, I cannot share more plans un unless we have an NDA, so we can talk about that. Yeah. No, it, it, it's totally platform agnostic. So wherever Silverlight runs, we will run. Uh, the question was like, will this run on only on Windows or any platform where Silverlight runs? So. Uh, what do you mean by sizing information? Yes. So. The question is, is there an easy way to figure out how many, how many servers I need to kind of deliver this end to end, including the edges? So as I gave, in the example I just showed for SNF, we use just two, two ingests and two origins. And the edge really depends on how big your network is and like what are the critical parts. So it, it's, it's really a customized answer for that. But, but you don't need a whole lot, essentially, if your enterprise is a very small enterprise. You don't, if it's a large enterprise like Microsoft is, the answer will be different. So there's no easy answer. I can answer numbers saying this much. But, but from an ingest origin perspective, yes, you don't need a whole lot of servers. Uh, what about the Microsoft PDC.com site? How many servers were used for delivering today? So Microsoft PDC.com is, is, is using a CDN for the edge. Okay? So, but from an origin perspective, there will be only a single server, primary and single backup. I don't know the exact answer, but I can find out. But I'm almost okay. sure that will be the case. Okay. For the open source player that you're releasing tomorrow morning, is there any support in it for any type of closed captioning or anything like that? Uh, the question is, in the Silverlight Media Framework, do we have support for closed captioning? Uh, we don't have that yet. Uh, Mike, is that right? Sorry. Closed captioning is not yet supported in Silverlight Media Framework, right? Not directly, no. But that's, that's at the top of the feature list for the next release. Yeah. What formats are you looking at to support? Uh, we're actually uh, working with the uh, W3C specifications for captioning, and I, I'm blanking on the actual yeah. name of it. So and we are also, we are also looking no, at... We'll support Smile, but there's actually some more very specific D right, captioning yes. formats for video. Yeah. DFXP yeah. and Sam, DVB, right? Yeah. So, so two things we are looking at in captioning area is DFXP and, and DVB subtitling. So those are currently at the pot. But if you have feedback, I mean, please do give us, because we are trying to close in on what is the best format. Well, DFXP works for American markets. It does not work that great for European markets. That's where DVB comes in. So that's, that's the dilemma, really. Okay. And internationalization is a high priority requirement for the framework as well. So we'll be doing multiple things. Okay. Are you looking at uh, time code embedding at all? Like uh, supporting like separate time code tracks to payload with it or anything like that? Like alternate audio tracks for? Yeah, like a simply time code embedded stream with it that you Let's can Let's talk some more. We'll talk about. Cases yeah. okay. and, and I will be in the IS booth, so if you have more questions, feel free to stop by. Um, most of tomorrow I'll be there, and even afternoon today I'll be there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.